We have achieved great things. We have made giant leaps. We've gone far beyond what we thought was possible. But we have only just begun. Our future in space is unlimited, and it will benefit all humanity. But it will take hard work, new technologies, advanced financing models, and enabling public policy. The Beyond Earth Institute is creating a policy and legal framework to enable the creation of economically vibrant communities beyond Earth. We will engage all stakeholders on critical policy issues, property rights in space, norms of behavior, conflict resolution protocols, filling the technology gaps, exploring new financing mechanisms, and making space settlement an agreed goal of the U.S. and its allies. Beyond Earth is committed to the true purpose of why we go to space. Join us on this journey. Welcome, everyone. My name is Steve Wolf. I'm the president of the Beyond Earth Institute. I want to welcome you to this webinar titled Artificial Gravity from Cinema to Reality. You know, and it seems about, it seems like just about every nation is waking up to the potential of space as an important economic driver. And some of us, and some are looking into space to access the resources and capabilities that will support new civilizations beyond Earth. And just to share a few examples of what nations are doing recently, you know, uh, South Korea just successfully launched a small satellite into orbit on the Nuru rocket, which from Korean soil, this is a rocket that was designed, that was designed and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and developed in, Korea, in South Korea. We know that Virgin Orbit uh, just made an un unsuccessful first launch attempt uh, out of the UK's uh, spaceport Cornwall. Uh, this is uh, the first attempt out of UK soil. We know that uh, in speaking to folks in Cornwall, I know that uh, they're disappointed, but they're not deterred. China, of course, is continuing its strong march into space with a planned 70 launches this year. And next year, it plans to launch a communication relay satellites that is going to support their robotics missions uh, to the lunar south pole and to the far side of the moon. China is not slowing down for sure. Uh, the Japanese, the Japanese company iSpace has successfully launched the Hakotu R mission to the moon. It's due to, it's due to land on the moon in April, uh, and it will be the first commercial spacecraft to do so. Uh, and, you know, and that's just the start. iSpace, I love this company, this company, it has a stated ambition to establish cities on the moon for a thousand people by 2040. Uh, and that's certainly the kind of organization that Beyond Earth wants to be part of. And actually, they have a wonderful video. I encourage you to go there. It's iSpace. Um, you know, here in the U.S., we're all anticipating the launch of the fully stacked uh, Starship, SpaceX's Starship. It'll be for its or first orbital mission. Um, <clears throat> and that's taking us one step closer to realizing the full potential of that new rocket. And they anticipate clearing technical and regulatory hurdles by February, as, as early as February and, and, and perhaps March. You know, each of these new nations that are embracing a space strategy uh, or send one of their own into space, this is triggering mi millions of new additional young minds to begin to question what space means to them and makes them wonder what life in space could be like. At the Beyond Earth Institute, we've, we're focused on helping to accelerate the expansion of human life and life overall into space through effective policies and regulations. In just, uh, in just the past two plus years or so, Beyond Earth has been uh, a significant voice in promoting uh, space settlement and enabling uh, a space settlement enabling agenda. To improve our efforts, uh, I want to announce in this program today that Beyond Earth Institute is standing up our new leadership council. The BE Leadership Council is established as a principal conduit for stakeholder engagement, 
with the Beyond Earth organization in our efforts to gain knowledge and insight into the essential issues that will help to advance our mission. The Leadership Council through working groups will help to shape policy recommendations that can be uh, that, that can be researched and presented by Beyond Earth. There is much to say about this Leadership Council and, and I encourage anyone who's on this call is interested in being involved. If you're with, an, with industry, with academia, government or NGOs we, and wish to participate in this, I would love to hear from you. Advancing a Beyond Earth agenda sometimes means that we're putting a spotlight on the critical technology gaps that exist, right? How do we close those gaps? In today's program, we take a look at one of those technology gaps, artificial gravity. Now, artificial gravity is really a standard in science fiction, as we all know, but it has been mostly a back burner research area for NASA and industry. But that's all seems to be changing. As the prospects of human occupation of space increases, artificial gravity will become an essential capability that, will, that we will need to understand and develop so that we can fully utilize this capability. And before I inter and, and that will be the topic of today, of course, and before I introduce the moderator for today to really dig into this topic with our panel, I want to thank Cody Nipfer, one of our newest uh, Beyond Earth team members for his leadership in producing this program, as well as for being the lead on our webinar schedule for the rest of the year, and encourage you to come back again and again as we put on these programs. Um, so right now, I would like to, um, let's see, I would like to introduce our moderator, Mike DeRosa. And uh, just as by way of introduction here, uh, Mike DeRosa is co-founder and chief marketing officer for Gravitex Inc. Um, they are developers of next-gen space stations and LEO infrastructure. As Mike states in his short bio, he is a zealous and optimistic about the future of humanity, both on Earth's surface and beyond in the new in the high frontier. I just want to mention Gravitex. I want to give them a shout out. They have been a great sponsor and a partner with Beyond Earth so far, where we look forward to a long working relationship with them. So to get into this awesome program today with some incredible uh, participants, I want to turn the program over now to, to Mike to, to moderate this and to get us going. So Mike, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Steve. And I want to thank uh, Beyond Earth for uh, putting together this event and, and getting such a great panel together. So we are talking about a topic that is a favorite among many people, artificial gravity. Uh, now, there may be people watching this who don't really know what artificial gravity is. So I'm going to kind of get the basics out of the way right up front uh, before we introduce everyone else. Um, in general, we, we're talking about spin gravity. This is the kind of force that you feel when you use when you you um, are in an amusement park ride like the Gravitron, uh, and many amusement park rides. You know, when they spin you back and forth, it's kind of a um, an artificial force. You know, a human created force uh, that one day we will have in space. And um, generally, we talk about spin gravity because that is something that we can do today. We have the technology to spin people around. And we've, as I said, we already do that with the Gravitron in amusement park rides. Um, so there are obviously a lot of people who love Star Wars and Star Trek and uh, you know science fiction content that involves people just magically having gravity present. And I don't just mean they're sticking to the floor, but gravity is much more involved than just sticking to the floor. Um, you know, magnetic boots aren't, aren't going to cut it in space. You have, uh, you know, when you pour a glass of water, when you use the bathroom, all these things, uh, you know, there's a lot of logistics involved. And there's also a lot of uh, biological, um, you know, uh, considerations, which we'll get into when we when we start talking about the science behind uh, artificial gravity versus microgravity. And when you hear people say zero G, just to get some terms out of the way, uh, you know, the technical term is microgravity for, for the environment that you feel when you are in space, when you are orbiting the Earth or orbiting a body in space, uh, you are in a, in a microgravity environment. So uh, if, if you hear zero G slip out, we really mean microgravity. There's always a, a little bit of, of force 
uh, that that's felt. You know, you're constantly in free fall when you're in space, when you're in orbit. Um, so that's uh, just something to keep in mind as as we move forward. So um, with that, uh, I'd like to in, uh, introduce some of our our awesome panelists. Um, we'll we'll just go around the room, uh, starting with uh, Peter, Tarek, then uh, Dr. Matre and Dr. Iyer, and then Chris Luki. So uh, Peter Garretson uh, is independent uh, strategy and, and policy consultant, senior fellow in defense studies at the American Foreign Policy Council. Uh, Peter, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you got interested in artificial gravity. Well, I uh, spent a full career in the U.S. Air Force as a strategic planner and became convinced about mid-career that space was really where the major opportunities for humanity and for the United States were, and got interested in that and uh, played a role in the starting of the Space Force and helping them with their initial thinking. And I have a book out, Scramble for the Skies, a forthcoming book on the next space race. And I, I'm fundamentally interested in artificial gravity because I think it's one of the key components to allow humanity to get out there and persist, as well as to sort of uh, win uh, in the overall uh, competition to make sure that uh, the values of human liberty are able to prevail as we expand. Great. Uh, Tarek Wakid, founder of Type 1 Ventures. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks all for attending. Uh, my name is Tarek. As, as Mike said, I, I, I'm the founder of Type 1 Ventures. We're a venture capital fund that focuses on investing in anything progressing humanity towards a Type 1 civilization. So Type 1 civilization being on the Kardashev scale. A lot of that is space and what we call space adjacent technologies that will sustain humanity um, into a continuous human habitation in space. Uh, so on um, where, where policy tends to fund things that can't be profitable or aren't profitable in the short term. We look for things that can be sustainable businesses. And we are, um, you know, we were the first investors in Gravitics and led their recent $20 million seed round. Thank you, Jarek. Dr. Sadita Matre, Senior Scientist, KBR, NASA Ames. Hi, everyone. Um, happy to be part of this panel. So um, I'm a, a senior scientist at the KBR working for NASA Ames. And by, uh, by training, I'm a neuroscientist, and I always had an inclination towards space research. So that when the opportunity for NASA are kind of presented, I was really happy to hop onto it. And it's a really uh, exciting time. And uh, artificial gravity, uh, the concept of artificial gravity itself is very intriguing. As we, uh, as human, um, has evolved, human as well as other or, uh, microorganism organisms, have evolved under a gravity and the physiological systems are evolved to function under the gravity. So, so what happens when there is lack of gravity or low gravity and there is a problem as a researcher to kind of try and solve that problem is where my, uh, my interest stemmed from. And that's how I'm involved in uh, this artificial gravity. Great. Thank you so much. Dr. Janani Iyer, scientist, USRA, NASA Ames. Good morning. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody, wherever you are from. Uh, and uh, really happy to be part of this amazing panel and looking forward to the discussion today. Uh, by training, I am a neurobiologist, similar to Sadita. And um, my space research journey, so as to say, started about five years ago when I joined USRA, University Space Research Association, as a scientist working uh, at NASA Ames Research Center. And right in, the, in my first project, I was given this opportunity of uh, flying a payload, a biological payload to the International Space Station. And also along with looking at the effects of microgravity, also had the opportunity of using uh, artificial gravity or simulated earth gravity on the space station. So that's how that was my first introduction to space as well as space research as well as artificial gravity. And since then, I've been investigating the effects of altered gravity on biological systems. And this is just such an exciting time as a sci fi buff, as a space buff, to be involved in research in this exciting time when things are moving like really rapidly and 
what seemed like just a science fiction now is becoming a reality. So yeah, that was, that's basically how I got into it. Love it. Great. So now we have uh, Chris Lewicki, co-founder and CEO of Gravity Labs. Hi, everyone. Uh, happy to be here on a, a busy Wednesday in January, talking artificial gravity with everyone. Uh, I'm an aerospace engineer by background. I worked at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory for about 10 years, landing rovers on Mars, uh, then uh, about another 10 years working in asteroid mining, uh, kind of two ends of the spectrum. And I got interested in artificial gravity, looking at uh, the development of space from an infrastructure standpoint. We have spent a very long time learning how to get to space and learning how to deal with those first steps without uh, you know, the presence of the 1G that we're familiar with on Earth. And we've learned a lot of problems. We've created a lot of workarounds. But what we've really learned most is that it's really not sustainable for life. Uh, any, any environment long term uh, without some gravity uh, really causes lots of problems. So if we want to go up to a place and stay, whether that's an orbiting space station, the surface of the moon or the surface of Mars or somewhere in between, we actually need to solve the problem of being able to create gravity on demand. And we know very little about how much gravity is needed. Um, and we haven't done things that we know should be the next series of steps in developing this area. And I'm happy to be on the panel today with everyone who is making strides in that direction. Great, thanks so much, Chris. Uh, yeah, and I'd love to get into to some of that, how much gravity is needed that you just mentioned. Um, so why don't we start with with some science talk uh, for the research that's been done. Um, and I'd like to ask Dr. Matre uh, and then Dr. Iyer can join in to tell us about uh, the artificial gravity research that you've conducted and um, help us getting a starting point for the effects of microgravity and artificial gravity on living organisms. Dr. Matre. Sure. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, so Jenny and I have worked together in this project and uh, we can answer this question or tackle this question as a team. So uh, before we go into much detail, I would like to take a step back and uh, really talk about a little bit about this unique spaceflight environment and challenge it poses when we would uh, with, for current and future space travelers. So spaceflight exposes uh, crew members to various space stressors, which includes altered gravity, going from hypergravity to microgravity, like increased radiation, there is hostile environment, isolation and confinement. And another important factor is distance from Earth. So as we go to the exploratory missions, there would be an important factor that uh, to be considered as distance to, from Earth, and we need to equip and have our, research, our crew member ready to kind of come up with real-time solutions. So um, there have been decades of research that has been carried out for to actually understand these stressors, how these stressors individually as well as in combination work uh, uh, towards uh, changes in the physiological system, how, how what, uh, uh, what changes they would exert. Like for example, uh, we know that there is a bone density, uh, loss of bone density, there is muscle atrophy, there is cardiovascular deconditioning, changes in spatial orientation is um, accounted, then there is immune response become kind of uh, 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 a, a different kind of immune responses uh, 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 seen in the astronauts and crew members. So um, basically in order to answer all these questions, we want to kind of have different model organisms to study what exactly happens to the physiological uh, system when these space stressors are acted upon it. So in our research, uh, we use small yet very powerful and mighty uh, animal model organism called Drosophila, which is like fruit flies. These are fruit flies that you see in your kitchen, like these are the pesky flies hovering around bananas left out. No one cares about it, but actually they are really, uh, like they are very uh, mighty in a way that they are small organism, but have strikingly sim uh, uh, similarity to higher order mammalian systems. So research in fruit flies can actually be 
extrapolated uh, to some effect. Uh, for example, in fact, there is a 75% human disease causing genes are actually present. They have a counterpart presence in uh, flies. What it means is these multiple uh, disease and disorders can be very well studied in, uh, in flies and modeled in flies and have been all uh, uh, done. In fact, there is research that is done in these humble fruit flies have resulted uh, about nine Nobel prizes and, and it just keeps on going. So we use these model organisms to study uh, what effects space stressors have on, on the different physiological system in these model organisms uh, with fruit flies with other mammalian models. Um, maybe uh, Jan Lee can talk about more of our research and our recent publication. Thanks, Adita. Um, so like Sadita mentioned, we work with fruit flies. These are small. And um, that's actually an advantage in space because there, there are space constraints. So these take about less space. Um, and in our recently published study, uh, what we looked at is uh, what are the effects of microgravity in flies and along with all the other stressors that uh, Siddhita just mentioned about, um, which are in the low Earth orbit on the, on the International Space Station. And so we used a, um, uh, a new hardware was developed, which is called the multi, multi views variable gravity platform. And one of the salient features of this hardware was we were able to, um, we, we, it had a centrifuge. So we were able to spin a set of these flies, a group of these flies, so as to simulate uh, artificial gravity. And in this case, we simulated Earth's gravity, Earth's 1G gravity. So basically we had two groups of flies, one set, one group in the microgravity environment, along with all the other stressors on the International Space Station. And the other group was centrifuged. So it, it, it experienced the Earth gravity, so as to say, simulated Earth gravity, and along with all the other stresses. So the difference between these two groups was just that artificial gravity was augmented in one of them. And um, uh, the other thing is, um, we basically sent flies up there in this hardware, and we let them breed there. So the flies that we actually evaluated or assessed for uh, changes uh, were completely reared in space. And uh, what we and once these flies came back to Earth, we assessed them immediately, and we found that there were physiological changes in the microgravity expo exposed flies, which were to some extent, to to a large extent, um, rescued or suppressed in the Earth uh, in in the flies which were augmented with artificial gravity. But then we didn't stop there. We also kind of aged these flies uh, so as to acclimate them back to the Earth environment. So for about, uh, we let them hang around in the Earth environment for about like 25 days. And then when we, when we again evaluated them, we saw that the uh, microgravity flies, they actually became worser, worse than what they were immediately post-flight, but also that these group of flies which were supplemented or augmented with artificial gravity, they also started showing some of these changes that we saw. So this kind of tells us that there is like partial protection that um, artificial gravity provides. But of course, this is like, our, this is definitely a, a first step, first step in fruit fly research uh, in the right direction. And uh, more research needs to be um, done in this towards this end. But this is really promising, at least from our end. Yeah. So can you yeah. repeat the last part that the, the one the fruit flies that were exposed to artificial gravity saw some of the same changes that the ones that were of the ones that were exposed to microgravity? So basically, we had like two different time points that we assessed one immediately after they came back from space. And right after they came back from space, we did not see any we saw all the uh, we saw protection of the changes observed in microgravity flies in the artificial gravity, kind of that gave us a sense that artificial gravity is working, right? So it is able to, uh, uh, it's, it's basically behaving like the control flies that we have on Earth. But then when we age them for like 25 days, that's when the switch happened. The uh, artificial gravity flies, they were somewhere in between the control Earth flies and the microgravity uh, flies. So this kind of like a, like, a, like a dose response, if you may say. 
So I see. Okay, was, thanks for clarifying. Yeah, so there was a partial protection that was seen. It's just as they age, the, maybe there was other stressors that might also account towards these changes. And just to be clear, when you say protection, you're referring to the artificial gravity being effective against uh, the negative health impacts that microgravity would have on organisms. As compared yeah. to the controls that are seen, uh, that were read completely on Earth. Okay, great. So can you go a little bit further and explain uh, some of what you know about how life responds and adapts to just microgravity? Because I think that's a good good baseline. I mean, I'm sure there are people watching this that, that aren't familiar with the uh, effects that microgravity has on um, you know the human body and and living organisms in general sure so Diva, do you want to take this yeah sure uh so uh, microgravity as i said mentioned earlier microgravity is a unique environment and uh, we know that there are changes that are seen uh, like physiological changes that are seen like bone loss a muscle atrophy cardiovascular uh, deconditioning to uh, to some extent and in order to counteract these things, like the, these are kind of the responses uh, of human or, or physiological system or living organism towards the environment such as microgravity. But in order to counteract such uh, changes, physiological changes, there is uh, aerobic and resistive ex uh, exercise that is kind of set in astronauts' regimen. Uh, astronauts themselves are kind of uh, very active, inherently active. So when they are asked, like, this exercises are is a part of supplementing uh, their activity also and uh, to uh, come back at as how our system would adapt to microgravity well our system is very ma uh, malleable and it's very adaptable and that's kind of a feature and not a bug so if you may say uh, our body kind of adjusts uh, to microgravity uh, where we have these changes like uh, loss of bone strength or muscle, that's because the body doesn't need that, those kind of things. The, uh, the guidance system is different uh, in microgravity environment. So uh, it's, uh, it's very adaptable. And uh, the main thing or um, uh, the main problem I would say arises not because uh, we are adapting in that gravity, but when we come back to a certain gravity, so when we go in microgravity and come back to 1G, there is a drastic change in the environment and how the body kind of would be able to adapt to that drastic change is what we want to try and address here by augmenting with artificial gravity. So if we can, uh, we can like our system is very robust and it's adaptable. So if we can have this uh, transition from one gravity to another and we can somehow make it much more smoother, then it will be easier for physiological system to adapt to those things. So from science perspective, all these things are needed and research and to be tested of how much, what, what the duration should be, what the frequency should be, and what level of uh, gravity should be given in order to uh, kind of ease that transition from one gravity to another gravity level. And just to add to that, this is going to be even more important as we go, as we plan our lunar missions and our Mars missions, because there the gravity level is definite. It's, it's more than microgravity. It's like 0.116 on lunar surface and then 0.38 on Mars. So this transition that Sarita was talking about, that's going to be like the key and how, how we can make sure that our body is able to adapt better and make that smooth transition. And artificial gravity hopefully will help uh, with that. Well, I think the, the research that you've you've so far conducted, you know, kind of points us in the direction that it, it definitely will help. Uh, we've seen, um, you know, a, a lot of different examples of astronauts coming back from microgravity with, you know, health concerns that are, you know. Um, uh, there's bone mass, uh, loss of bone mass, and and things like that. There's uh, um, the the fluid in in your eyeballs changes in microgravity. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different different health concerns when you and the more time you spend in, you know in microgravity, the the kind of the worse they get, uh, because humans are 
and and really everything living that we know of is used to being on the Earth's surface, where you're you're doing everything under the force of gravity, even while you sleep. If you sleep for eight hours, well, your body is fighting against gravity for eight hours to stay in its its shape, and to for you know the the blood to pump the uh, your heart to pump the blood to your brain. Um, so I think um, it, it's been great that that you know the two of you have done such great microgravity research. Um, I wanted to ask uh, one more question about about the science uh, before we get into the 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 policy and stuff like that. Um, what specific further research do you think we need next or or what what further projects if you're allowed to talk about them um are you going to be doing next to to kind of scale our understanding of artificial gravity and its effect on humans in space so you put it rightly you know we definitely need to do more research before we start implementing artificial gravity as a countermeasure right uh, the more the more tools the more information that we have in our arsenal the better equipped our crew would be when they go to these long duration missions. And um, you rightly pointed out, yes, there are certain deficit, certain changes in the human body that we see when they come back. But then th we do have many of these countermeasure um, study, countermeasures that have been implemented like um, exercise training, exercise regime, routine exercise regime for the crew, as well as resistive training, which have helped us counter, and also nutritional supplements, which have helped us counter the bone loss and the muscle atrophy and also help for the cardiovascular deconditioning. Um, so, um, but then as we go deeper into space and we increase the duration of these missions, then comes the need for us to supplement more uh, to what is already existing. And that's where artificial gravity comes into play, right? And that's where we are, we are all here discussing this uh, cool technology. Um, and it's, it's been, research has been done for decades now. Things have been, we have been doing things in the right direction, uh, but certain gaps which, or certain questions which are still out there is, you know, how much gravity do we actually need? Do we need the entire dose of 1G Earth gravity, or would we be would the biological system be able to perform at capacity at a lower level, for example, maybe like partial gravity? So there is like a huge continuum, right, from 0G to 1G. So where would that nice, good threshold be? And then it's not just, and one, one particular gravity level might not work for all of our biological systems or all of our physiological systems, right? And then even when you have like this type of uh, centrifugal force, right? You will have more G, higher G in your uh, feet and legs rather than, uh, than your head or your heart, for example. So there is going to be um, a difference in that level as well. So we kind of need to have like more research and more studies done as to kind of figure out what G level uh, do we need? And also what should be the duration of this? And again, more like, do we need like a continuous source of this artificial gravity or can it be intermittent? And if it can be intermittent, then what should be the frequency? How many times uh, do we need to like go through the centrifugation process and what time of the day, right? Like how you said, eight hours, one third of the time of our life on earth, we are, we are in the, we are sleeping. And of course, gravity is acting there too, but it's at a different axis. So maybe we can do with less duration um, of the, of G, but these are the like, open-ended questions, right? These are the things that we need to work more on. And also the time of the day where you want to expose, um, where you want to have these artificial gravity exposure, because we know that that can also affect the circadian rhythm. Uh, so we don't want to add more problems without uh, doing our due diligence and doing uh, the research to kind of address uh, these different uh, these different questions and also as you venture into the venture into uh, Mars and Moon where you have partial gravity there also to kind of understand where is that threshold where we can work um, where we can perform at our but uh, at potential if we can do that in partial gravity then that that might be an e easier solution. Uh, be, I mean, engineering wise as well, I guess. Uh, I would like the other experts answer that. And in terms of our research, um, 
we do have a space flight mission coming up where we are trying to where we are looking at investigating the effects not just on microgravity or earth gravity but also kind of simulating partial gravity lunar gravity and mars gravity on the international space station so that will that's like another step one step further from what we have done now to understand uh, what dose do we actually need and basically that's that's also going to be in fruit flies but that will also give us more information a step in the right direction and then followed up by more studies in mammalian systems um, that we can follow up on yeah all right thank you so i want to go to uh chris and maybe tarik will have some thoughts on this too um i want to talk about the, the limiting factors what's been limiting us from from just forging ahead we've seen a lot of great artificial gravity concepts over the past 50 years in movies and concept artwork uh, but we don't have working artificial gravity tech in space right now. So what's kind of stopping us from our progress in gravity research and system development? I'd say probably only ambition is stopping us. Um, as you pointed out, like Werner von Braun and Disney were talking about this in the 1950s. Um, 2001, filmed in 1969, um, you know, famously brought the idea of a rotating space station uh, O'Neill and his students at Princeton looked at this in the late 70s, uh, even in the 90s into the 2000s when we were building uh, what is now the Space Station Freedom, or excuse me, the International Space Station. Um, somewhere in the transition, we actually lost uh, a Japanese centrifuge module, and not a small centrifuge, but the you know a large one that uh, that people could be in. Uh, and in part, it was just because of conflicting requirements and complexity. Uh, it's easy to put a can in space and fill that can with life-saving equipment and get back and forth to it. Uh, but to, to spin that environment up is a little bit more difficult engineering. And you know, in the crawl, walk, run phase of things, we just haven't quite got to the walking part of, of, of uh, space development. But um, continuing that metaphor, I think it's going to be necessary for us to run. If we are spending most of our time with uh, counterfactors and dealing with limited deployment to, to a microgravity, we're not going to make rapid progress in space. So I think that's that's been part of the limitation. But I would also say, especially uh, respective of um, you know your company, Gravitix, uh, and others who are working in this area, it is uh, you know it's kind of time time for us to try a broader range of things. Uh, we've learned so much about my, microgravity because of the spaceflight programs uh, that followed landing on the moon uh, and the initial space race. And the International Space Station itself has been a fantastic venue for exploring this. Uh, it's because that we have this research facility that we understand all of these detrimental effects of um, microgravity. But we don't understand the continuum in between of partial gravity just because we don't have great facilities. There's really small centrifuges on the space station that we can fit fruit flies in. Uh, you know, we can put uh, roundworms in there. We can grow yeast. Uh, we can grow Arabidopsis, uh, mustard seed plants, all very small things for short durations of time. We've even managed to adapt uh, tiny little cages to put uh, white lab mice in uh, to do very short duration studies on mice. But what we really need is, um, you know, a variety of facilities from, again, from bacteria all the way up to families uh, to be able to address this. So um, I founded uh, Gravity Lab kind of in pursuit of this to allow us to access programmable gravity uh, anywhere between zero and one so that we can look at Earth gravity, we can look at Mars gravity, we can turn it on and off, we can understand in a comfort standpoint for human tended space stations and Coriolis effects in your inner ear, uh, what are good rotation rates and radiuses? Uh, and it's something that we can do a lot cheaper and a lot more cost effectively than landing on the moon and building a facility and certainly than landing on Mars and build a facility. So while we're seeing a number of um, microgravity space stations being uh, funded by NASA to to follow on the space station. I'm really excited that uh, commercial ventures are looking for the opportunity that's really gonna weave all that fabric together and allow anything from basic research to manufacturing to entertainment, you know, and, and living and working uh, to happen. Yeah, I definitely agree with you, Chris. And I think why we haven't done it, I think it comes down to cost and the underlying trends that are happening in the industry. 
So if you look at why would we need gravity when the ISS was built, the ISS can hold four to six people. And so is it a nice to have or a need to have at that point? Right. And so when it comes down to decisions on cost, and then it doesn't help that when you work with large institutions like government institutions or even private institutions that are very large, there's a lot of cost plus. And so budgets become inflated. Look at what SpaceX did and what the SLS has done and the cost associated with that. With the advent of lower launch costs and the continuing trend of lower launch costs, you're starting to see the business cases close for having these other nice to haves of the past, like artificial gravity. And so why we were excited about Gravitix is because we see those trends moving in that direction. And then a business like Gravitix makes sense from, hey, I can get investors behind this. This will make money for people involved, from the employees to the stakeholders, and it'll benefit other companies like Axiom, like uh, Northrop, all building their own space stations that currently buy hardware from, say, Talisalania. Great modules built there, but you have to understand that the, the new launch vehicles coming online two years from now, three years from now, five years from now, are going to enable a lot of different things, like the manufacturing approach that came down to weight of how much you can launch the space. Then you have to think about the calculus of how, what am I going to build to put on these launch vehicles? And I have one shot on these launch vehicles because they're not reusable. So I think you're starting to see a lot of these things move in the right direction. Even in the CLD program, a stretch goal for the winners was gravity. It wasn't a, 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 a requirement, but it was a stretch goal. And so as you see the other underlying factors trend in the right direction, you're going to start to see a lot of these things. What I think policy can do ultimately is put the right incentives in place. I don't think that policy is going to be the driving factor of why these things materialize. I think less policy, less regulation is probably the best bet and let the innovation really happen and let it and, and take form. Um, but, but I think, yeah, we're moving in the right direction and you're starting to see it with you know, gravity, your company, Gravity Lab, and what Gravitix is doing and what the CLD program has done. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm really excited and optimistic about the future, as, you know, all the panelists here have said. And yes, research is very important. Research answers questions for us, but it's not going to be the driving factor of why these things become materialized and then sustainable in the long term. Because if yeah. you ask me, would you put investor dollars behind NASA? I'd say, probably not. But do we need NASA? Yes. Right. One, one thing I'd add to that, Tarek, I've been a robot guy for much of my career, and uh, we certainly can go places with robots that people can't go. Um, we can do things with robots that people can't do, but robots don't create economies. Robots don't create markets in order for us to really develop and thrive and see you know, growth in space beyond seven people on a space station. Uh, we need to get dozens and hundreds and thousands of people not into space for, you know, short tourist stints, but, you know, to have a job in space, to be on the construction crew, to be on the power uh, production crew, uh, to be raising families. Uh, everything that we do uh, in any exotic destination on Earth, we we can do in space. And the more people that we have there, the more uh, the more of an economy we're going to have uh, that'll, you know, ultimately snowball uh, and become self-sustaining. I agree. And if you look at, uh, say, a country like the UAE, it was a, the real estate there was desert. They created an economy around that. And now that real estate is worth a lot more. The same thing can happen on the moon. The same thing can happen on Mars. And the same thing can happen in low Earth orbit and beyond. And when and you, it's not just going to be robots. I mean, some people may be cyborgs 100 years from now. So the, the line between robot and human may be blurred. But um, Ultimately, I definitely agree with your point. That's great. So um, why don't I ask uh, Tarek, what's the, the, how do you see the investor uh, and capital appetite for artificial gravity capabilities growing over the, the near term, over the next few years? Um, when you can take 100 people to space, say on a starship or another vehicle, there's nowhere for those folks to go currently. And so if you look at why we, I guess I'll talk about gravitics because this will play into your question, but 
if you look at Axiom and all the other CLD players and all the other early stage startup, there's a dozen early stage startups working on space stations. And for those folks to build a viable business where I'd say, okay, I'm going to invest in those space station operators, there needs to be underlying launch cost at a certain level, and there needs to be the hardware for that to be successful. And so when I have those two things in place, adding another widget, which in this case, we're going to call artificial gravity a widget, and it's much more complex than that, I think the appetite there on the investor side becomes once you achieve those two things. So a lot of people want to invest in SpaceX. There's a lot of investor appetite for SpaceX. But then there's a lot less appetite for the early stage startups comparatively to SpaceX. Once SpaceX becomes, and, and a lot of the other great launch companies like Rocket Lab and such, um, once that becomes a you know guaranteed, these are going to succeed and continue to succeed, then that extra investor spillover falls into the other next lowest hanging fruit, as we say. And then I, I, I can start seeing the riskier investors, the ones that are more long-term thinking. Because if you look at any artificial gravity company or any long-term space business, they tend to be 10, 20-year investments, unless you can find a viable business model that enables something in the short term with a long-term vision. Take SpaceX, for example, and I talk about them a lot. Um, 20, 30-year vision to get to Mars, but no investor is going to give you 20 30 money for 20 or 30 years, there has to be an economic incentive for those investors to tie up their money in a company like SpaceX. SpaceX succeeded a lot because government, the government contracts supporting them as well in the early days. But I like to find businesses and I, I think it changes investor appetite where it's like, hey, our long-term vision is enabling artificial gravity, but our short-term vision is enabling the space station operators. And that's why I think Gravitic succeeded so well. All right, well, thanks for <laughs> thanks for the nice shout out for Gravitics. Um, so I'd like to ask uh, some, some development questions, some policy questions, and I'm gonna go to Peter and um, also back to Chris. I think Chris, you're gonna have some good things to say about this. Um, Tarek mentioned that the CLD uh, program, also known as the CDFF program, they kind of changed the name, which stands for Commercial Destinations Free Flyer, so, so Commercial Destinations in Space. Um, so the CDFF program uh, is almost entirely microgravity focused. Um, basically, NASA wants to, you know, have a presence in space after the International Space Station has passed its time. Um, so. They did have uh, an artificial gravity stretch goal um, that was requested, but no plans to achieve that goal surfaced as of yet. So all the, the companies that um, have been working on commercial LEO destinations, commercial low Earth orbit destinations, have not had a, an artificial gravity component. Um, and so I want to think about why is that? and. Uh, I want to go to Chris and and Peter for that. Whoever wants to jump in first on on where we're going with the policy and and the requirements for our our next generation uh, systems up in low Earth orbit. I'll, I'll I'll hand the microphone to Peter. So you know I, I actually think I might differ uh, with something Tarek said earlier about uh, the primary reason being cost. I actually don't really think that it's cost. I, and I do think policy interacts strongly. So I think the problem is incorrect problem definition that, you know, NASA has grown up with a sortie mentality, you know, a, a destination to go visit or camp sort of mentality rather than a developing infrastructure and settlement mentality. And when you define the problem as sending a few people, you know, to go spend a few days to a month to maybe just two years, um, you know, you can afford to ignore uh, things that are important to settlement, but settlement means children, it means the ability to come back and forth to, to earth, it means long term health, and therefore, you know, that drives a research program that answers the fundamental questions of how much gravity, what interval, you know, what strength of gravity, what do we need to know about gravity for our processes, for our food production, uh, to move further out. 
So it is, it's the failure uh, of our national leadership in Congress of expressing their will in no uncertain terms as to what problem NASA needs to be solving, uh, that, which is human settlement of space that would enable the kind of research program that puts this on the critical path. And, you know, uh, various advocacy groups, old and new, since the very inception have been pushing hard for artificial gravity, but basically not gotten the time of day because uh, the, the goal as specified was a visit mentality rather than a let's be there and stay as human beings mentality. Yeah, and I think you know this is part of what I really like to see in long-term strategy is like, well, what's the ultimate goal? You know, the ultimate goal is uh, we're talking on behalf of the United States, but, you know, a permanent U.S. economic presence in space. Uh, permanent meaning, you know, we don't have to uh, perpetually uh, build everything from scratch and refurbish everything and ship in all the supplies remotely. Uh, we ultimately want something uh, that can become more and more self-sustaining over time. It'll take a very long time um, and start sending exports back to Earth uh, or uh, start creating value in space, either in the information age or uh, by creating energy uh, or providing security. So in a lot of ways, you know, our, our, our planning horizon really just goes, you know, for the next 10 years. We aren't really thinking on a 50 to 100 year timeline, um, which you know, it might just be cultural differences uh, in terms of, of how we plan for the future. So, I mean, it could be that uh, artificial gravity approaches uh, seem like they're more difficult, but if you don't ask for input, you don't ask for ideas, you're not going to get innovation. Uh, so this is where, again, uh, the private sector is set, setting up with ideas, um, many of which will fail, uh, but some of them will succeed. And as has always happened through history, uh, it's those people who step out on the edge with something that might be obvious to only a few people that ends up being kind of the new inevitability. So part of the engineering problem, I think, is, you know, how do we break um, everyone's mental picture of an artificial gravity space station? You know, the, a big rotating cylinder. It's huge. It's kilometers across. Thousands of people are living in it. How do we do that, you know, 10 people at a time with you know, a Starship or a New Glenn launch or a handful of them. And there too, I think there are plenty of engineering solutions that can fit uh, with those new capabilities that are coming online um, where we can do, you know, maybe one launch, maybe a couple of launches to establish a foothold on uh, beginning to understand partial gravity and how to maintain that environment in the same way that we went from Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo capsules to the shuttle, to the shuttle cargo bay, to the station. Um, we just need to choose to do so. So, Peter, um, how should artificial gravity fit into national strategies and policies for space exploration uh, and eventually off-world habitats? I'm glad you asked. Let me show you a couple of pretty pictures that I think will make this clear. Um, so uh, let me just start here at the top. Can you guys see my uh, slides? Yes. Hold on just a second here. Let me try again to share the correct slides. So, you know, I think that what we have to start off with um, is, uh, is thinking about this in, in the biggest possible picture. And so when we think about what uh, rotational or spin gravity offers, uh, we wanna talk about the strategic context uh, and where policy must go. And so, you know, as we've already said, everybody's familiar with spin gravity. It's a childhood experience. You've seen it in the media, you know, from the old Von Braun days, which has been mentioned in 2001. More recently, you've seen it in the Martian and Babylon 5 and Medina Station or the behemoth on the expanse. But why bother with this? Well, fundamentally, it affects who can go, how long they can stay, how far out they can go, can they have children, and will those children be able to return to Earth? And so when we think about the big picture for humanity, 
we're fundamentally talking about human flourishing. We want to be a spacefaring species. We want to expand the domain of life. We want to take our environment and its species, not just us, with us. And we want to preserve our health and perhaps our form so that we can have a continuity between us and our dependents. And so fundamentally, a spacefaring species must procreate. And that means that we have to be able to conceive, we have to be able to gestate, we have to be able to grow properly. And what has 50 years of microgravity research taught us? It's bad for human health. We decay, we can't produce. We don't need any more data to tell us that this is bad for us. And so we need to start thinking about a tech tree, you know, if any of you have played Civilization or similar games. And this tech tree that leads to large scale space settlements requires a number of things, but right there on the center is rotational gravity. And it's been something that's been championed by many of our uh, space advocacy groups, including the National Space Society, it's Milestone 6. And it's not just in free space. Conceivably, you could also have rotational gravity on the moon or planets to increase. And the, the size of this, the potential expansion for, for potential expansion of life is phenomenal. Over 3,000 times Earth's livable surface area using asteroids, something on the order of supporting 10 million billion people in the solar system. But that's not going to happen without uh, fundamentally knocking down uh, spin gravity. Now, some folks are already thinking ahead in the policy space. So this is a Space Force document saying that the United States should establish space settlement and human presence as the primary driver of our national civil space program, and that everything needs to be assessed in their utility to further space settlement goals. Now, the Space Force Air Force Research Lab and DIU have also looked at, like, what are the centers of gravity for space leadership that matter to strategic competition? And human presence is one of those six things that has to uh, be taken care of. We've talked about the problem with the Coriolis force and, uh, and what it needs, but part of the good news is, is that human beings appear like they can adapt at much lower levels. And when we talk about something like what Chris is looking at with uh, Gravity Lab, it's amazing how the rocky planets where we could go, where we might wanna do industrial processes or have a human settlement, are nicely grouped. Essentially, you've got Earth-like gravity with the Earth and Venus. You've got Mars and Mercury-like gravity that are almost identical. And then you've got a grouping of six large moons, Europa, Callisto, Ganymede, Titan, Io, and our moon that are all about lunar gravity. And then a bunch of other, you know, uh, dwarf planets that are large enough that are roughly about, you know, a, a 20th of gravity. And so having a variable facility can teach us a lot about what are the industrial processes that are going to work? What are the farming processes that are going to work? What do we need for conception that we know we can go further out? There's a question about China. Of course, you know, it is, it is the opinion of many that we are in a space race with China and that uh, uh, this race seeks to achieve nothing less than the establishment of the per first off-planet human settlement propelled and sustained by a thriving in and from space economy requiring infrastructure and a free and open cislunar system where we're able to build very, very large structures in space on the sur planetary surfaces. And we know that China certainly is looking at that. They are pursuing growing in space. They're pursuing kilometer long spacecraft for artificial gravity. They wanna be the first to colonize the moon and Mars. And so if we wanna have this extremely ambitious future where we can move out, there has to be a stepwise plan, starting with small things like gravitics, building to larger and larger stations, and ultimately to the O'Neill cylinders that can house tens of millions of human beings. But the problem, as I said, is the lack of goals and vision, that settlement and development versus a camping trip is not actually in our laws. So what must be done? We need clear direction regarding the goal of space settlement in law and a sense of Congress that we can't be left behind competitors. We need to lay out the questions that need to be answered. Specifically, can spin gravity allow human reproduction, gestation, and long-term health? What is the prescription in terms of magnitude, duration, and interval? We have to align the incentive structure for NASA and commerce to enable this. And we need to be funding partial gravity research on private space facilities 
of which we have a number of tools. And then why isn't this a focus of our new uh, ISAM and cislunar strategies? Uh, and of course, we can do early things, testing this gestation and development on primates. And that's, that's the sum of my pretty slides there. Oh, thank you for that. That's great. I'd like to add that uh, you mentioned all of these different moons and def uh, destinations that have different, um, you know, variable gravity and that we, we need a, a, a facility uh, where we can test things in different gravity levels. Um, and I just like to add the location of that facility is it makes sense to be in low earth orbit, the closest it can be to being on earth without being actually on the earth's surface and, and you know, being in space. Um, so having access to a facility that's really close that we can see what it will be like to be on a, a moon of Jupiter or be on Mars uh, in that, that gravity environment is going to be absolutely invaluable. Um, and we just need to actually put it in space and, and get the hardware set up to do it, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and exactly. I do think begin. that, you know, private industry is the right way, but it should be supported by government, you know, funding and policy to make sure that that we are leaders in this. Chris, did Just you have something add? With respect to the, uh, the destinations, we don't uh, develop climbing equipment on the top of Mount Everest. Uh, we develop it, uh, you know, at many easier places along the way. It ultimately gets tested at some of the most challenging environments. Uh, but having that easy destination that's close to us, that there's a lot of traffic to, that there's going to be a lot of people living and working in very soon, uh, it's the perfect place to understand how to start to manipulate gravity as a tool, how we can use gravity for all the things that we already use uh, gravity for, you know, in, in mining and refining processes and manufacturing, uh, the medical industry, for food preparation, even washing your clothes. Uh, you know, I, for one, to go to, when I go to space, I'd, I'd like to wash my underwear, not throw it away. Uh, so it, it's, there's a lot of advances that we need for just basic comforts uh, and uh, being able to, to live a normal life in space. So I yeah. think everyone here, oh, go ahead, Tar. One last point. I, I do see your point, but I still think that the primary driver is cost. Uh, you can push policy for you know millions of people in space and in the solar system but if it costs you a million and a half two million dollars for every launch it's not going to happen and so government's role needs to be to pushing the things that are achievable for government and the best innovators the best innovations will rise to the top and private markets will fund those and the government needs to put its dollars behind the most effective and the most and the ones that are proven in the private markets supporting those not saying let's just throw dollars at everything and then the one thing i've ever i've learned is if it's free money it's going to be used like if my parents would give me money let's say part of my allowance i would spend that money incorrectly as opposed to if i earned it and so that's that's the one thing so there's a place for policy and i think it's very important but i think ultimately it'll be driven by costs and by the private markets. Um, can I just add one more thing? Please. Um, I understand this uh, webinar is about artificial gravity and we are focusing mainly on gravity, but as we are talking about settlement and then lunar and beyond in like uh, beyond low earth orbit, I think another important factor to consider would be radiation, deep space radiation. So uh, along with uh, gravity, that's something that we all have to uh, work closely and uh, make sure and there's a lot of research going on on that but we definitely need to look at not just one isolated stressor which is an important one but a combination of all of these put together along with distance from earth hostile environment and all the other things so just to put that in yeah, perspective yeah yeah no that that's great i mean you can't test you can test your artificial gravity uh system in low earth orbit but if you're within the earth's magnetosphere you're, you're not going to get the same environment that you're going to you're going to be in if you're orbiting the moon, for example. Uh, but I think that's kind of step two, uh, at, at least in my mind. Uh, once you you get artificial gravity working and able to do our experiments, the closest we can be to Earth without worrying about the other uh, other variables and factors, right? You kind of test one variable at a time uh, is the way I'm thinking about it. But absolutely, for for I, I agree with you that. To go out into the solar system, we need to solve more problems than just artificial gravity, for sure. Uh, and speaking of going out into the solar system, um, 
we're, we're kind of getting getting down to the end of our time here. We'll have a couple of questions from the audience, but first I wanted to just ask uh, Chris if you wanted to comment about, um, I know some of, you know, in, in your past life, you've uh, focused on asteroid mining and uh, looking in the future, can you tell us some of the things you've learned when working on solving the problems of utilizing the, you know, resources out in the solar system and uh, I'm, I'm sure you're going to have some robotic uh, talk in your answer, um, but also how are humans involved in, in that vision and what have you learned there and uh, what can we think about in the future when we think of, say, just mining an asteroid? Uh, will artificial gravity help us do that? Yeah, so, you know, from a resources standpoint or even just more broadly speaking from an industrialization standpoint, um, you know, the things that we can move most quickly on are things that we're already familiar with. So we probably have a better idea on how we'd move lunar regolith around, uh, you know, near lunar lunar poles or the polar craters, than exactly uh, what is the winning solution on uh, handling uh, asteroidal material in a microgravity environment. That's not to say that the asteroid problem can't be solved, but it's going to require things that we're not currently well experienced with. And one of the things we'd probably do uh, when we're refining and purifying and separating materials is we would use specific gravities, densities uh, of materials to do what we do in normal processes, which is let the light stuff float to the top and let the heavy stuff sink to the bottom. Um, we use that in all kinds of industrial processes, including mining. And in asteroid mining, we'd probably recreate that. So we would create a large scale centrifuge that probably shares a lot of the properties that we would create for a facility that people would live inside. So in many ways, these two paths are tied to each other. Um, so it's, it's again, like as I mentioned to you, uh, earlier, it's, you know, gravity is not a binary thing that it's on or off. Uh, it's a continuum. Uh, when we started out this panel, we were talking about, oh, what's the right prescription for gravity for human life? You know, the answer is we don't know. We haven't been doing the work to explore that, you know, we have an idea that it's not zero, uh, but we don't really have an idea of how far less than one can it be. Uh, and it it's kind of the thing is like, well, how light can you build an aircraft? How how uh, how much steel do you need to build a boat? Uh, you don't want to be throwing a lot of excess material and excess capability if you don't need it. So maybe we can raise families in one third gravity and, uh, or, you know, maybe we'll become belters if we do. Or, yeah. Uh, and, find, find a sweet spot. Yeah. Well, and, and I love, uh, Peter used a phrase about creating a continuum, uh, or creating a, what did you say, Peter, creating a, uh, a connection or, a with our families and, uh, just, you know, kind of being able to go to space and then come back to earth, uh, and not being an invalid. Uh, you know, for having spent a lot, a lot of time in space. Uh, so, you know, that's something, you know, we, we could, maybe we just need gravity at night when we sleep. So the body can reset itself. We, we don't need 24 hours of sleep. So clearly, you know, maybe we don't need 24 hours of gravity, but um, the answer is, again, we really don't know. So uh, in the same way that we've developed, developed a lot of approaches and tools and techniques for solving problems, I think we're going to see all sorts of shapes and approaches for exploring and informing this question from large partial gravity stations to small platforms like Gravity Lab is developing uh, to where we can hit this in a lot of directions in parallel. Awesome. So uh, I want to get into a couple of uh, audience questions. Just uh, these can be for anybody who wants to jump in. Um, the first one is a bit ambiguous. It's, um, is artificial gravity research applicable to solving the down mass problem? Um, as in bringing large cargo payloads from space to earth. And I'm not exactly sure, uh, what that person meant, but maybe somebody here wants to speak about down mass and how, uh, artificial gravity, uh, plays into that. Well, I mean, uh, we can't know. Uh, what was meant by that, but I mean, this is not, you know, anti-gravity, this is rotational <laughs> gravity. Now, you know, there have been ideas for a long time about rotational tethers being used to raise and lower things from orbit while conserving momentum. So you could look up momentum exchange tethers, which is, you know, similar in principle that, you know, at the edge of the tether, 
you know, you are experiencing um, a, a gravitational like load. Um, but, uh, but artificial gravity itself is something that you experience internal to the system uh, as it's, you know, uh, rotating uh, sort of against where you were. Um, and so, you know, in and of itself, you know, it, it's not going to provide a solution to down mass, but it will allow you to produce a, a broader spectrum of things in space that you might want to bring down. Yeah, whenever I get space elevator questions, I tend to put those in my mind towards the the kind of uh, conspiracy theory end of the spectrum of, you know, uh, not quite the Earth is flat or, or uh, you know, we didn't land on the moon type of thing. But um, we're just it's just so unfathomable to, to picture a, a space elevator. Um, so I don't I'm not sure that, that the person meant specifically something like that. Um, but. You know, talking about artificial gravity, we know that we can spin stuff. We spin stuff on Earth. We can spin stuff on space and create it. Um, so, I, I could imagine dropping something off of the edge of a spin system to uh, have a tiny amount of change in velocity, uh, but it's really going to be a drop in the bucket compared to what you need to uh, to deorbit and um, come back to Earth, come back to the Earth's surface. Um, so. Uh, somebody asked uh, from the chat here, what is the confidence level of the likelihood of human rated artificial gravity systems being developed in the light of the transition phase from the ISS to private space stations? And I think that's a great question. It's something my company is kind of working on helping support. Um, and so what what, are, what is our confidence level on, here on the panel of having artificial gravity space stations come out of you know these next steps that that humanity is taking in in low earth orbit destinations what's the time frame 2031 um well the iss is slated to deorbit around 2030 got it uh, so uh will we have artificial gravity capabilities or will any of the space station operators be able to do it i say yes is it going to be a fully immersive system that's that's more a drop more more a question but will will it be able to be done i i, I truthfully believe yes unless we have some catastrophic failure in, in the whole wider industry yeah I'd, I'd vote yes as well i think being able to do you know at the very least uh what i'll call a um an impermanent demo <laughs> uh where you know something you can maybe create artificial gravity environment uh for weeks or months maybe a few years uh, and in the process of doing so, like all of engineering and design, you learn things that you didn't expect. Uh, you find solutions to those problems. Then you go through another iteration. Uh, so, um, but I think certainly beginning that iterative process, uh, we actually, uh, people may not be, be aware, uh, back in uh, the 60s, uh, the, one of the Gemini missions, um, 10 or 11, I think, uh, actually had a tether and a, and a Gina rocket booster strapped to each other where they try to do a little spin up and uh i will say it was a productive learning experience <laughs> for for when they did that and maybe uh a, a vote for not using uh uh floppy structures for doing this uh so um uh so it's already started we just need to get back on that track yeah uh, um chris can i ask you about your uh, what Gravity Lab is doing. If you want to tell us a little bit about that, I think this is a good time to talk about what's happening in the future. Yeah, absolutely. So Gravity Lab uh, is really extending what is already happening on the International Space Station in terms of iterative research and small-scale manufacturing research and development. Uh, this is a topic that NASA is already spending a few billion dollars on, both internally and externally through various programs. And we want to create an environment of about 150 liters of volume uh, where you can take those experiments that have been on uh, either microgravity on the space station or in the small centrifuges and scale them up both in size uh, and quantity as well as duration. And really the key thing is to be able to take, for example, an Arabidopsis, a, a plant research experiment for one example, and go through its entire life cycle from seed to seed to understand how are we gonna have sustainable crop growth in, in space? Um, how can we water those plants efficiently where we, you know, we don't have to worry about, um, you know, where the water is going to go and where the water is going to stay. Um, 
ultimately, what we would like to do is be able to support uh, ideas like the Mars Biogravity Satellite, uh, an idea that a number of my, uh, MIT students and others, uh, Erica Wagner, who I think is on uh, the call with us today, uh, did her PhD work in that area. Uh, we'd like to be able to support multi-generational uh, rodent research in this area so that uh, if and when people want to have kids on the moon, we will already have gone through that environment uh, in, in a model organism, uh, as Dr. Matra and, and Dr. Iyer have talked about uh, earlier in the call. So we want to support those environments. Um, ultimately, we'll, we'll, we'll increase in complexity. One of the, to answer another question that was in the chat, the, one of the technical barriers that uh, we are mindful of is managing a very large, uh, slowly rotating structure in orbit. Uh, it's something we've never uh, it's never done before, at least on unclassified missions. Uh, and uh, it's something that uh, to when we want to scale these things up to have them very massive, we want to operate them efficiently and safely. And uh, there might be reasons to spin things up and spin things back down uh, and change rates. How do you dock with something that is rotating? Uh, those are all things that we're going to have to master uh, in the same way that we've mastered aspects of microgravity. And we think the Gravity Lab, uh, Gravity Lab platform can help contribute uh, part to that uh, as the larger platforms with people on board uh, kind of use those solutions and extend them. Great. I mean, I can say that we, we're all excited to see uh, the future of Gravity Lab and what happens next. Uh, for Peter, here's an audience question for Peter. Um, do you envision any political uh, slash policy forcing function that would change the USG slash federal cultural hurdles that you discussed earlier in the direction of artificial gravity? Certainly. I mean, I, I think that if uh, China succeeds in doing their kilometer long uh, structure to test uh, artificial gravity, that will be an embarrassment that will cause many people to sort of say, you know, what what are we doing? Why aren't we moving faster? Is that is that um, in any way analogous to uh, when we landed on the moon and beat Russia to the moon? Uh, I mean, I think it's actually a little bit, but it's more analogous to what happened when Chang'e four landed on the moon on the far side, and they succeeded in doing something that we had never done. And that, you know, more than anything is what created the Artemis program and even kicked off the Space Force. So, you know, the, the, the chance uh, and, you know, that China has many things coming, you know, they are building a prototype solar power satellite, they're building nuclear uh, uh, rockets and nuclear uh, power and propulsion systems. Uh, you know, they are walking down the tech tree that it takes to be a spacefaring civilization. And sooner or later, you know, our, our politicians will realize that the game is not space exploration, it's space development and settlement. And once they understand and get their head in what the game is, they will demand that our civil institutions like NASA and Commerce get their head in the game and, and start addressing the right things. That's great. Uh I really like when you when you say maybe I'm just a video game nerd, but when you start talking about tech trees. I get I get excited. Um, so uh, I think we can go into closing remarks, you know, one or two minutes from each person. We have about 10 minutes left. Um, we'll start again with uh, Peter first, um, and we'll do the same order as before around the room. So one of the things I want to know from each person as we leave here is uh, what are you most excited about in your vision? Uh, for the future of artificial gravity? Well, I'm most excited that we actually have companies that are attempting to do this. And, you know, to the extent that they succeed, I think it will greatly increase excitement because I think at this point, you know, this generation is far less excited about going and seeing something new and far more excited, you know, about the types of visions put out by Musk and Bezos have actually settling space of moving humanity and our ecosystem off world and uh, and the fundamental enabler or one of the key fundamental enablers that you're not going to be able to do it without is spin gravity and so i think that you know as we actually start demonstrating to ourselves that we can do this and that it actually works to to mitigate some of the effects of space 
and enlarges the sphere of life and uh, and space development, that's going to you know further increase our nation's investment in being a spacefaring nation and a, and a spacefaring civilization. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Tarek, I'm, what are you uh, most excited about? I'm excited about finally being able to dunk a basketball because I could only do that in lunar <laughs> gravity. So hopefully so when there's, uh, when there's a, a, a station with uh, lunar gravity or Martian gravity, maybe I'll be able to jump high. You're, you're uh, solving but, the most important problems. Yes, of course. And I think it go, I, for me, it goes hand in hand. It's, it's to get the public excited is how we do this is we get the public excited we get the youth excited and because those are those are the kids that are going to grow up to live in a world like that and so we set those foundations we build the innovations in and and so I'm, I'm excited for the whole industry uh ultimately to to progress and i think artificial gravity will get, be a key point that will progress the space station operators will progress the launch companies give them more launch capacity and there's places for them for the people to go and then the cost of launch comes down and so it doesn't cost 50 million dollars to go to space but it costs you know less than a million or half a million and, and jobs are created and when those jobs are created there's an incentive for people to go so i'm excited for all of that to play out and all the sci-fi books i've read and and it's it's going to be an exciting it's an exciting time to be alive. So I'm ultimately excited for everybody around the room and and everybody in the audience to actually be able to experience that and see that. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Matre. What are you yeah. most excited about? And if you can and if you can give us any any hints about uh, future artificial gravity research, uh, we'd love that. Oh, uh, as Peter uh, and Tariq just said, like it's it's an exciting era especially looking at different uh, uh, commercial strides that has been made. Uh, with, as a researcher in this field, I'm really excited uh, to be part of this. And uh, from research front of view, uh, point of view, we know that our research kind of showed that artificial gravity is a promising countermeasure that can be explored further. It's something that should be explored further. So we are very well equipped uh, uh, to go further away from just lower earth orbit to know what exactly uh, exploration mission would uh, uh, encounter and to be uh, better supported, to support our crew members with knowledge as well as research so that they can take decisions in real time uh, as well as like hardware that can be present there. So I'm really excited on that. Uh, and in terms of like uh, future research, uh, as Janney mentioned, this is like something that's coming up in next couple, uh, probably uh, in, uh, in a year or so. We are trying, uh, we recently got a grant where we are looking at partial uh, dosage of gravity and seeing what effect those dosage of gravity would have. So keep tuned, <laughs> stay tuned on that. That's great, excited to, to see uh, all those experiments happen and, and the results, and, and it's very exciting. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Iyer, what are you most excited about coming up? I think most excited, I think it's the curiosity in me, which got me to be a scientist, right? To understand, to know more about. And we have, we've grown, life as we know has evolved in 1G. So to kind of know, like, you know, what would partial gravity do to our body and how would our artificial gravity kind of help us in that. So it's basically the scientist and the curio, cu curious kid and me who just wants, who's excited about this new era. And then, you know, um, to learn more. And as we venture in like uh, all these commercial uh, platforms that we are getting commercial companies in the lower earth orbit for all the manufacturing and uh, tissue engineering, for example, and then beyond lower earth orbit, I think this is just such a great time to be and to kind of, um, no more. So it's it's for me, it's more personal that I'll be able to understand more human biology and biological systems in general. Um, that's what I'm most excited about. Thank you very much. Chris Lewicki, without spending a full 25 minutes, um, I'm, I'm just saying that because I know you're you're so excited about about the future and the next things coming up. Uh, what are you what are you excited about coming up in the world of developing artificial gravity? I'm just excited about uh, both creating and having access to places to explore artificial gravity. 
Uh, progress is made when we have places and tools to make progress. And for now, we've been limited to a five second drop tower experiment, a 30 second uh, partial gravity aircraft parabola, uh, a few minute uh, sounding rocket, uh, sort of over rocket flight, um, or a, you know, a tiny little test tube on a space station centrifuge. Uh, so to be able to break out of that box, both in volume and time, um, and uh, then I think as Dr. Dr. Iyer had mentioned, um, or perhaps Dr. Matra, be able to go out, uh, you know, beyond uh, the magnetosphere into the radiation environment, uh, and just start learning what it's going to take to build a civilization in space. Um, we are at the very, very beginning, and uh, it's very exciting to be able to uh, to contribute to that and to uh, see the progress and uh, the shots on goal that uh, Gravitics and and other companies are taking into making this feature happen instead of hoping someone else will create it. Uh, you you miss every shot you don't take, right? So more shots on goal, the better. And uh, thanks for mentioning Gravitics. Uh, I realize there's a lot of people probably watching this that don't know too much about Gravitics. Um, so in my, my closing statement, I'd just like to say that uh, Gravitics is trying to manufacture uh, the next generation space stations that are just, the, the goal is to make the best space stations that you can make, not, not thinking about artificial gravity. This, these are space stations that are, you know, bigger, better, more capable. Um, and artificial gravity is something that we're, we're planning for the future. So, you know, a lot of the questions that I've asked these, the, the panelists today have been about when in the future uh, are we going to do things and, uh, you know, it's been how, the what, but also the when, and uh, people might come back, uh, you know, every day in my my life, people ask me when. Um, we were planning on having our first modules in space in 2026. Um, theoretically, we would have the ability to spin our module, as you would have the ability to really spin anything you send into space if it has the proper uh, equipment on it. Um, but our, our goal with our modules was to kind of future proof them. So our modules are designed to, in the future, be able to plug into a system that spins them and not fall apart. Um, and you can't really say that for anything else that I know of going to space, maybe aside from the, the um, hardware that uh, Chris Lewicki's company, Gravity Lab, is building. Uh, so we're super excited to, to do that, but we kind of want to walk before we run um get our get our modules into space and have them just improving space systems as they are today and kind of be the united states uh top manufacturer of large scale space systems so you can check out our website gravitics.com and look at uh our starmax product and um learn more about gravitics so thanks so much i'll throw it back to steve and thank you to the beyond uh, beyond earth institute for having us and for putting together this great panel Hey, bravo, bravo, Mike. And thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Uh, Matra and Dr. Iyer, Mike, uh, Peter, Tarek, and Chris. This was, I, I learned an enormous amount during this call, even, you know, and uh, Beyond Earth Institute is looking forward to continuing this dialogue. This is such, as you're saying, it's such an important dimension of, 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 of what we need to do to, um, um, to really make the an environment in space where people can live and work in a comfortable in a comfortable continuous uh, format. So the, this is a, a critical technology. So we'll continue to do this. I do want to. Uh, I did post our next meeting, which is uh, paving rules for the road towards space migration. This will be February. Uh, 16th of next, of next month. It's in the chat field. The, the link to that program is in there. We, Beyond Earth Institute, is looking to host programs on a monthly basis of this sort of stretching, sort of going a little bit beyond where the current conversation is within the space policy community. I want to thank everyone. We, we were over, we we're over 100 people here on the program for a while. Tremendous amount of, of input. Thank you so much for the links that were put in there, the conversation that took place. Um, and, uh, you know, we will continue this conversation going forward. Again, thank you all for coming. Thank you again to our panel, and we will see you next month. Thank you so much. Take care now. <laughs>